for to everybody for joining us. Uh, the Honourable Minister uh, Mamluko Gubai, uh, welcome. And um, thank you to uh, all of our media partners for joining at such short notice. Um, we have all of our panelists here now. Um, now, we have uh, called this urgent press uh, briefing in order to inform the public of uh, some developments that have been reported from our researchers and scientists in regards uh, to this pandemic which have implications for the pandemic and also, of course, is very important for all of us to know and understand so that we all understand what we need to do in order to curb uh, the uh, further resurgence that we are experiencing in this new third wave. Now, the Minister of Health is going to lead a, a panel uh, which is going to uh, uh, present some uh, updates to everybody. Um, we have um, Professor Tulio Jolivillera who has joined us who is a member of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19 and, as we know, is one of the lead investigators of the genomics team from CRIS, which is uh, was the Natal Research uh, Innovation and Sequencing Platform. We're also going to be joined by Professor Kolega Milisana, who is the Chair of the Ministerial Advisory on COVID-19, and we're also joined by uh, Professor Helen Rees from um, SAPRA which is our regulator for our medicines and uh, tools for, for um, uh, uh, case management. Now, without much further ado, I would like to invite the Honourable Minister to uh, continue with the chairing of the session, and then I will be back for the question and answer session. Minister, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Loise. I'll just make some few remarks. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen and members of the media as partners. Um, let me acknowledge uh, Professor Tulio de la Oliver, together with Professor Mlisana and Professor Ruiz for really agreeing to, for joining, to join us at this short notice. Um, I would want also to really acknowledge um, the media for responding so quickly in short notice. We were in NCCC this morning presenting what we are presenting now to the nation. I think firstly, it's, it's important for us to remain and remind each other that where we are in terms of infections, we are in the third wave. We continue to see infections rapidly rising and the number of these infections continue to rise and Gauteng continues to be the epicenter of these new infections. In the last 24 hours, there are 18,762 new cases, which represents a 25.5% of positivity testing rate of this housing accounts for 11,777 new cases. We remain very worried about the rise in the hospitalization, which is putting a lot of strain in the health facilities in Gauti. The trends are clearly showing that other provinces are going to experience the trend we are seeing in Gauti, notably in the Western and Eastern Cape. Nationally, the numbers have surpassed the first wave peak and we are likely to surpass the second wave peak. Previously, we had communicated that the third wave peak is likely to surpass the second wave peak. Sorry, it's unlikely to surpass the second wave peak. So we were not seeing these numbers in terms of modeling, but this was based on the fact that, on the assumption that South Africa does not, in case South Africa does not get a new variant. So if we do not, we do not have a new variant, would see the peak of the third wave being just below second wave. Unfortunately, this is no longer the case. Our scientists, after their sequencing experiments, have discovered that we have a new variant that is prevalent in the, our country. This new variant is called a Delta. You know that it's not a new in terms of existing only in South Africa. It exists in other countries. So Professor Oliveira, will provide the details about this new variant, how fast it is spreading and its behavior in general. Professor Liz will give us a clinical perspective as well about what it means for our fight against COVID-19 in light of the emergence of the data virus. The presentation will also look at the implications of this new variant for the manner in which we are currently managing the pandemic and our vaccination program. Professor Mlisana will provide details on the implications, and then Professor Rees will also go in details in terms of the effectiveness of the vaccines in light of the Delta variant in South Africa. 
Let me take this opportunity to thank our scientists who continue to do this work, and which is world-class scientific work, and the findings that helps us to continue to fight the pandemic and actually to continue to assist us to be able to make meaningful interventions. Again, let me thank the Department of Science and Innovation led by Minister Nzimande, who continue to fund and make funds available for this important research. I think broadly, Oswan, appreciating the support from our colleagues in the NCCC, together with the president and the deputy president, who continue to give us guidance and support in the work that we are doing in managing the pandemic. I think more importantly, South Africans, who continue, those of us who are responding to the call by government to say, let's work together. And the frontline staff who continue, despite the difficulties that they have, to continue to bear the brand and actually giving hope to the hopelessness. I know as, a minister, as the acting minister currently, I received quite a number of messages from South Africans who are appreciating the work that is being done by our nurses, by our doctors, and this gives hope to our health system that continues to carry the burden in terms of fighting this pandemic. I'm going to now hand over to Professor Tulio de Oliver to start in terms of the presentation in what we have been able to find with the work that we are doing. Over to you, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Honorable Minister. Yeah, good afternoon, yeah, DGs and DDGs, and, and more important, uh, good afternoon for the public and the media. Yeah. So, so as you, you are aware, we, we have invested uh, in South Africa on genomic surveillance so we could identify which virus yeah, is currently circulating in the country and the virus that had caused our waves. Yeah. So as the Honorable Minister <laughs> uh, presented, uh, what we have to share with you, it is, it is uh, that a new variant seems to be not only arising, yeah, but it seems to start dominating the infections in South Africa. So just one second. I hope you can see my, my screen. Is that? Yes, is yes. Okay, thank you. So, 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 so what we will do is an update to the country on the Delta and other variants in South Africa. What, what we will do, I will start the presentation. I will pass to my uh, colleague, Dr. Richard Lessos, and then to pr Professor Colega Milsana, which will comment what the impact, especially of a new more transmissible variant in South Africa. And then to Professor uh, Helen, his that will comment on, on the vaccines, the effects of the vaccines, yeah. So as mentioned by, by our Minister of Health, we have been also very fortunate to get very good support from the Department of Science and Innovation, the DSI of Minister Blade Zimandi, and from the Medical Research Council to continue this, this work. And this work is done in collaboration with many institutions in the country, yeah? Include the University of Cape Town, the University of Stellenbosch, the Free State, WITS, the NICD, and I am based at CRISP at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Yeah. So, if we start, yeah, let me just take you a little bit slow to this slide. Of course, uh, potentially everyone know what's happened in South Africa, yeah, and you will know uh, more what's happening in Gauteng because that's what is in the news. But what we show here, it is three pieces of information. In brown is number of cases, weekly cases. In black is the uh, mortality. And in this red line, which we have the intervals, is what we call the reproduction number or over time, or RE. And one thing that we always worried, yeah, is when it's above one. What it means when it's above one? At the moment, it's at 1.3 in South Africa. What it means? It means that we enter an exponential phase of the pandemic, which the numbers are just growing very, very extremely fast, and they will keep growing in the next weeks. Yeah. 
So why is that growing so fast? Yeah. So why? So just to show you in that in, in this slide, yeah. Here in the x-axis, we have the time. So we have done genomic surveillance since the beginning of February last year, to be honest with you, as a network, we even sequenced the first contact case in South Africa. And in the y-axis here is the proportion of the genomes. When is white, it means in reality, not that we don't have data, it means that we have 20, 30 different lineages circulating. Yeah? So, so we had all these lineages until the appearance of the first variant, which you know very well, which you name 501.v2, which recently received a name of beta by the World Health Organization. And this variant displays all the other ones and calls like nine, more than 90% of all the infections in the second phase and was circulating, but then we start appearing other variants. Yeah? First one is the variant alpha. That's the one that caused the massive epidemic in Europe and the US. And then recently it appeared the Delta variant. So this is the variant that caused initially a massive epidemic in India and seemed to be increased very fast in frequency and dominating the infections in South Africa. We will be gathering more data in the next few weeks. So let me show you where this data is coming from. Yeah. So here, what we have, we are breaking down by province. It was in Natal, Halting, and Western Cape, the most central provinces. And you can see here that you had completely domination of the beta variant and then start appearing some other variants, the alpha and the delta. Yeah? But in the more recent data that we did as a community transmission in South Africa in KwaZulu Natal, and now we are busy working on how things is completely took over. And what we are worried is not only that it took over, it seems to be dominating all the infections, but what we worry the most yeah, is this coming from a really representative random selected sampling of over 30 clinical sites ranging from Hariguala, that's in the deep south of Pazulu Natal, close to, to the Eastern Cape, to Zululand in the deep north. So it's just spread everywhere in the province. Just to understand you, here again, I have the date. Yeah, I have here the frequency of the genomes, and here is the cases. And as you see, it was dominated by the beta variant. That was the first case that we found that was in a shipping. Uh, uh, harbor in, in South Africa, in, in Durban. And then we really thought that this would not spread because the other two sampling yeah, show still a dominating of, of, of the beta variant. But what we see is that is increasing frequency very, very fast. And that's associated with a very fast increase of number of cases in KwaZulu Natal. What do we have from the other provinces? In the Western Cape, we see a very similar scenario, but not only with the beta, also the alpha and another variant called eta that it has been originally identified in, 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 in Nigeria. But once we identified, and this is work from Caroline Williamson from University of Cape Town, yeah, once identified the, 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 the delta variant, it seems that it's also stuck a big third wave. And that was identifying the garden root and in all the sample sample in the garden root. Still a small number, but we've seen this association. Yeah. In Hauteng, we are busy um, gathering more data. There was detection of the Delta variant. Yeah. And that in the beginning of the third wave, and at the moment, yeah, the NICD is completing this, the, the, the sequence of um, of how things, but what we decide as a network, we decide to help. So CRISP is going to be producing, and in the next three or four days, together with the NICD, we'll be able to close all this gap in how things. But given what we saw in the other two provinces, especially in Natal, that when appears the belt is the beginning of the third wave, we would be very surprised that we don't see in Gauteng the same case that we see in KwaZulu Natal, that this was completely associated with the increased emergence of the Delta variant. And we're gonna have all this data in the next few days, but to, just to confirm, and that's where it went in extreme level, yeah. So I will just give you some uh, one or two more information about that, and then I'm gonna call my colleague and Professor uh, uh, Melissan to comment, yeah. So what, what is this uh, virus look like? So here, 
I'm just highlighting, and that's a little bit technical, so don't worry too much about the, te the, the technology. Here we have the spike protein. And that, that variant initially was called the double mutant. Yeah, Why it was called a double mutant? Because it has these two mutations in the spike gene. Yeah, The beta variant in reality had three mutations. Yeah, But one mutation that may be associated with very high transmissibility in the scientific screen is this one, is exactly in the cleavage site, which makes the virus potentially to replicate much, much, much faster. Yeah? So now what we have is a variant, delta variant, that, that emerge and begin to see much more transmissible due to mutations in the in the genome yeah so what happened with this variant yeah and you're going to remember was first identified in india again we don't know if it's originally from india but was originated in was identified in india and you may remember the tragic images of of the indian pandemic this variant, as the other variants, is spread extremely fast. Yeah, now is in over eighty-five countries, and for example, have entered in the UK, and now it's dominating around ninety-five percent of the infections in the UK. In Africa, it seems to be very widespread, also with many uh, sites in Southern Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, and West Africa. So not only this variant seems to be spreading very fast, but it's very quick to start dominating potentially the global pandemic. Yeah. So what is the, the summary of the Delta variant? Yeah. So one thing, what we know, what we don't know, we're gonna be highlighting the next few, few slides. First, it is really, really highly transmissible, yeah more than all other variants, including the one in South Africa, beta. And that's potentially why I have displaced beta in KwaZulu-Natal. And unfortunately, we expect that to also be displacing all the beta variants in the other provinces. Uh, it is calculated that's potentially double and more transmissible than, than the original virus. Yeah? What's the disease severity is no clear evidence yet. Yeah, but one thing that we know is that when transmission grows very, very fast, yeah, we overwhelm our hospitals and we have extra deaths, not only from COVID, but also from other diseases. Yeah. What we, we didn't expect, the word is that a higher risk of reinfection. Why that? Because the reduction in neutralization with serum from people infected with the beta variant seem to be not too eff highly effective against this Delta variant. So even, and we didn't expect that all the previous experiments show that very high level of antibodies would protect it against all the other uh, variants and lineages and that potentially why they didn't enter in South Africa. But this one seemed to break a little bit uh, the, the, and more likely to cause reinfection. Yeah. One good news, if there is any in, in, in that, yeah. But the main good news is that there is no evidence of vaccine expect, uh, escape. Potentially, these variant vaccines are more effective than the beta variant and give a high level of protection against several diseases. Yeah. So I would just ask my colleague, uh, 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 Dr. Richard Lessos, to, to explain the next few slides. Just one second, please. Thank you, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, DG, DDG, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So Tulio has summarized what we know at the moment about this Delta variant from uh, what we understand from colleagues uh, across the world. So just to give you a little bit of detail about, about these key aspects of this variant, so in terms of the transmissibility, and remember by transmissibility, we just mean how efficiently this virus spreads from person to person. And as Tulio mentioned, we have pretty good evidence now from multiple countries across the world that this variant is more transmissible than any other variant. And that includes the beta variant, it includes the alpha variant that was previously 
uh, widespread in, the, in Europe and in the United States. And we think that it's, a, it's around 30 to 60 percent more transmissible than these other variants that, that have been circulating. And that also suggests that if we compare it to the original virus that, that first started spreading around the world, it may be around twice as transmissible as that early virus. So it just really highlights that this is now a highly transmissible respiratory virus. It spreads very easily from person to person. And that just highlights to us that to control it and to prevent its spread, we all need to try even harder with all the basic prevention measures. In terms of the disease itself and the clinical presentation, there's some evidence from some settings that the symptom profile might be a little bit different with this variant. And certainly in the UK at the moment, the most prominent symptoms are headache, sore throat, runny nose, and sneezing. And what's less prominent are some of the symptoms that we previously highlighted, like loss of taste, loss of smell, fever. Now, we don't know for sure if this is because of the variant, it's a feature of the Delta variant, or whether it might be just because the variant in some settings is affecting different age groups in the population, or that it's affecting people that may uh, have had one dose of the vaccine and, and therefore the, the clinical presentation is slightly different. But the point of mentioning this is just to highlight that these are the, the kind of symptoms that we should still be looking out for um, on top of all the normal symptoms of fever, cough, shortness of breath. As Tulio mentioned, in terms of disease severity, we don't really know yet whether this variant is associated with more severe disease or an increased risk of death. Um, there's some early suggestion from the UK uh, that there may be an increased risk of hospitalization uh, with the Delta variant, but there's also no current evidence that there's increased mortality with this variant. So we need more data from multiple settings to understand this. But as Tulio mentioned, this kind of becomes insignificant because, because of the increased transmissibility that in itself drives the, the cases of severe disease and the, the cases that will end up dying uh, much more than whether the virus affects the, the severity of the disease. Um, here's a little bit uh, detail um, about the vaccine uh, effectiveness. And here the best data we have comes from the United Kingdom because they're quite advanced with their vaccination program now and they've been vaccinating as this variant has been spreading uh, across the country in the United Kingdom. And there, some of you will be familiar that they are using two vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, which is one of the vaccines also in our vaccination program. And what I'm showing you here is just some data about the effectiveness of the vaccine, both after the first dose and after the second dose. And what's key here is that with the Delta variant, the vaccines remain effective after you've had the two full two doses of these vaccines, either the AstraZeneca or the Pfizer vaccine. So although there's a bit of drop off in the effectiveness after the first dose, as the immunity is building up, this disappears once you've had the full two-dose schedule. And what's important and critically important is when you look at the more severe end of the disease spectrum and how well the vaccines protect against severe disease. And here is some data looking at the protection against hospitalization. 
And again, here we're comparing uh, the Delta variant to the Alpha variant, and we're looking at the two vaccines. And the key point here is to look at the far right column, which is showing you that there are very high levels of protection, above 90% protection against hospitalization uh, once you've had the two doses. And even with the first dose, there are very high levels of protection with this Delta variant. So very uh, encouraging news that the vaccines uh, retain very good protection against this Delta variant. So uh, just to summarize before I hand uh, back to, to Tulio, so Delta is now rapidly becoming the dominant variant in many countries around the world. And it looks like that is also going to be the case now in South Africa. The key point about this variant is the increased transmissibility. So it spreads very easily from person to person. And it does this even better than the other variants that we've become familiar with. Um, we haven't gone into detail about this point, but um, we do see in the laboratory uh, that people who've had prior infection with the beta variant, which is relevant to us in South Africa, may not neutralize well this new variant, the Delta variant. And that raises some concerns again, uh, that potentially people could be reinfected with this Delta variant. But we need much more information and data about that to really understand whether that's a true concern. And then the evidence around the vaccines is encouraging that there's very good protection, very high levels of protection against the more severe end of the spectrum, which is what we're really uh, interested in with the vaccines. And so just finishing with that summary slide again, just to give you the, the highlights of that. And I will hand back to Julio to uh, summarize that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. I think that um, what, what I would like to do now, if it's OK, yeah, I just would like to ask uh, Professor Koleka Melissana to comment yeah, about this, this summary. Yeah. What is the effect to our health system, especially how overwhelming it has happened on increase on transmissibility and, and to see what we have to kind of do in the next few weeks to reduce that? Uh, th thank you very much, Tulio. And I'm, I'm fine for, uh, for you to just leave the slide on, then I can talk to it. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Minister and uh, the Deputy Minister. And I also really would just like to um, uh, say good afternoon to everybody who is on this uh, call. Um, Tulio, I actually wanted you to leave that last slide on because I want to address those four areas. So basically, if we're looking at what has, um, has, has been highlighted is that um, we now have got a, a, a different variant introduced into the current pandemic, which is in, into our third wave as we speak. Because even as the modelers had actually uh, uh, um, came up with uh, with, with, with what's likely to happen. There was always a caveat that said, provided there is no new variant that comes into the picture. This is what would then need to happen. And now that we've got data that is showing that we do have the Delta variant circulating, and we've just heard about the characteristics of the Delta variant. And just to remind everybody that actually globally, there are four variants of concern, which is the Alpha, which was in the UK, originally you know, identified in the UK, 
Currently in the country, we have been having the beta variant and then the delta, which is what we're talking about today, as well as the alpha, uh, sorry, the gamma, which was uh, first, uh, which first originated in Brazil. So now that we are seeing evidence that the delta variant might actually be uh, 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 spreading over and taking over from the beta, the question becomes, what does that imply then? Looking at the high transmissibility, it actually is not surprising that even though we don't have data for Gauteng as yet, as uh, 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 Tulio has already mentioned, it is not surprising that we're seeing these numbers that we're seeing in Gauteng. And looking at how quickly this uh, variant actually uh, leads to increased cases, probably for the other provinces as well, we're just talking a matter of days. And so whatever is applicable to Gauteng today, we'll be seeing the same happening across the provinces. We will see these high cases. And the next question of disease severity, now, even though there's not enough evidence as yet, we need to look to see, we can already see that the hospitals within the Gauteng province are struggling severely, which means then over and above the number of patients that have been there before who are seeing the admissions that are due to COVID-19. And, and the third part is the risk of reinfection. Even though we would like to believe because of the exposure that has been happening across the country, <clears throat> wherein people have actually had, you know, have been infected with COVID because it's now a, a, a different variant. So one, we will not be surprised when we see a lot more of infections happening. What all this says then, it just goes back to what we have been saying, that if we want to then reduce the number of cases, if we want to reduce the, you know, the, the, the transmission rates, we're going to need to make sure that actually we get onto hard restrictions, tighter restrictions, because obviously what actually increases transmission is from person to person. And it's going to mean we need to be very decisive and go to an extent of saying, how do we then restrict movement? of persons and how do we actually, you know, how are we going to do that? And that needs to be done very urgently. It's gonna mean how do we then restrict even further gatherings? Probably should be saying there should be no gatherings whatsoever. What else can we do to reduce the transmission? And, and the next thing is going to be, as far as hospitals are concerned, because there's a likelihood of increased, you know, hospital admissions, how then do we ensure that you know, the facility readiness plans are actually in place? How do we ensure that the, you know, each and every province is ready for increase in, in, you know, in, 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 in hospitalization, which means the beds, which means human resources, which means oxygen, especially if we might find ourselves in a situation where the severity of disease, where we're seeing a lot sicker patients. So we need to be prepared for that. And then in so far as the, there was also an issue whether with diagnostics, are we able to pick up you know, the, the, the Delta variant? And so far, we really believe that the diagnostics that we're using as a country, we, we, we are able to pick the, you know, not the variant. And that's something that needs to be monitored because we don't want a situation where we would be missing diagnosis. But so far, the team, for instance, within the, you know, the scientific team, there's a team that's looking at specific diagnostics and we're not seeing an, a, 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 any effect in so far as that is concerned. So that's nothing to worry about for now. And I think in so far as the vaccines are concerned, uh, uh, Helen will probably want to talk on this, but what becomes important as well, whilst we're going to be emphasizing and looking at restricting movement, at the same time, we do want to see you know, vaccinations going on in the country. So we're going to need to come up with very clear clear, you know, directives. And I, I guess now speaking, you know, as the chair of the MEC 
co-chair of the MEC. We, we are actually currently putting together an advisory that will get to the minister probably by late today or, or tomorrow morning as to how else then do we feel we should respond as the country now that we see we have got the Delta variant circulating you know, in, in, in the country. Thank you, uh, Tulio. Should I hand over to Helen directly? Yeah, yes, yes, Koleka, uh, Professor Kolek Melissani, you are very welcome to, to, to hand over to, to Helen. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, um, my fellow panelists, and to all of the colleagues who are listening to this. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the regulatory authority, and I know we have spoken quite frequently recently about what the role is and how we do things, but I think it's really, really important to outline what we do and how we do it and what it means to have a variant and how we're going to respond to that as a regulatory authority. So the first thing to say is that SAPRA is an independent regulator. This is what we see worldwide. This is the best practice for regulatory authorities. They stand alone and they base their decisions on science. But SAPRA also takes into account the context. So um, the fact that we have a pandemic has meant that SAPRA has prioritized everything that it's responsible for to do with COVID. Um, and that includes diagnostics, ventilators, um, and in this case, we're talking about vaccines. When we look at a product, we look to see if it's safe, if it's good quality, which means how is it manufactured, and if it's effective. So those are the three absolutely paramount um, qualities that we look for. In an emergency situation, we are always willing and are looking at less data than we would have for an ordinary licensure of a product because we're fast tracking everything we see, including the vaccines. One of the things to remember and why this is so important, and I would actually say that SAPRA is always incredibly important. It's a pillar of the health sector, but it's almost more important now during a pandemic, and it's very important for vaccines. So let me explain that to why that is. When you go to a hospital, when you take your child in to get antibiotics, um, when you have a dental extraction, when you get an anesthetic, you want to be absolutely sure and confident that the medicines that are going to be used for you are safe and of good quality, and they're going to do what they say they're going to do. Now, in the context of vaccines, we already know that uh, in one study that was done in South Africa, that only just over 70% of people said that they were confident to have a vaccine. About 30% said they were still unsure. And even as we roll out the vaccines to teachers, um, there have been quite a lot of reports of people being unsure and insecure about having a vaccine. Now, if we are going to build people's confidence in vaccines, it's critically important that the regulator is allowed to do what it does best, which is regulate, to look at the safety, quality and efficacy of those vaccines. In the case of vaccines, though, we add a very important additional stage. So we have a lot of post-marketing surveillance, and this is very important when you have brand new vaccines, as we're seeing now. And in that post-marketing, after the vaccine is introduced into the community, we look carefully to see, are there safety signals? We don't only do this by ourselves as a country, we do this in collaboration with the World Health Organization and with many other countries who similarly report safety signals. Um, but what we're now discussing, um, SAPRA, the MRC, the NICD, the Department of Health, all in partnership, is the, the need to actually have a national protocol to look at the effectiveness of a vaccine. Um, remember that we're rolling out at the moment two vaccines, but in the future, we're very likely to roll out more vaccines. And as we've just heard, we've now got a new variant. And every time you see a new variant, we immediately have to say, ask the question, will the vaccines that we have work at all, work as well, work for mild and moderate disease, work to stop transmission of the virus, and very important, most important at the moment, uh, work to prevent severe disease and hospitalization and death. Um, so we, we have a protocol that's going to look at the effectiveness of vaccines once they're rolled out. And the way that we're going to do that 
is that we will look at what are called breakthrough infections. These are infections that people acquire with COVID who've had a vaccine. Uh, and then there are a lot of questions we have to ask if we see a breakthrough in infection. Has the person had a vaccine? Did they have two doses if it's a two-dose vaccine? When did they have their last dose? Because remember, vaccines don't work instantly. They take um, se several weeks to really get an optimal effect. Um, and then we ask how severe is the illness? Does the person have other comorbidities? What age group are we seeing these breakthrough infections? And importantly, we will be looking to see what is the uh, COVID virus that's actually caused that breakthrough infection. And that will start to give us a pattern of whether in the case of the Delta variant, we're seeing what, what we're seeing in terms of the effectiveness of vaccines. And Richard just showed you very nice slides from the UK that showed the effectiveness of the Delta vaccine you, when it, when it when with the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccine. And that's the other thing to remember is that as the Delta vaccine is becoming so prevalent across the world, that we are going to be able to draw on other countries' experiences of using vaccines that we're also using, and we'll be able to look and see what they are establishing in terms of the effectiveness of, of that vaccine. So just lastly on this, so, so far, um, as you all know, we've, we've given a, a, a conditional um, emergency licenses of different types to AstraZeneca, Pfizer, um, and to the J&J vaccine. There are three vaccines that have now been applied for. The Sinovac is the most advanced, and it's an advanced stage of, of review. The Sputnik um, as well is, is, is well underway in terms of the review. And a very new application has come in now for a third vaccine called Sinopharm. We haven't yet had applications for other vaccines such as the Novavax vaccine or the vaccine we heard a lot about this week in terms of clinical trials, the Cuban vaccine. So we don't have applications for those vaccines yet. Um, but all of those vaccines are being urgently looked at the CEO leads an internal team to review the data, but she has um, external teams of experts drawn from academia who help the internal team review all of this complex data that we need to understand when we review a vaccine. So it's not just the SAPRA staff, it's a, a large number of real experts drawn from across our academic institutions. And that is how a, a recommendation will then get made. But as I say, what we're also looking at uh, as we make these recommendations, and increasingly so, is really trying to monitor the effectiveness of vaccines, particularly in the context of emerging new variants. Last comment is, um, as Richard showed, it looks encouraging that so far it looks as if, even in the face of the Delta variant, that most vaccines might be protective against severe disease, and we'll be able to monitor that, and we will need to do that. Um, and and that's, that's very encouraging. But the most important thing um, is to really get the vaccines out as quickly, as quickly as possible. Uh, the longer we have large numbers of people who are not immunized, the more likely we're going to see the emergence of new variants. In addition, you can see how many variants are, are emerging all the time and changing, um, and the impact of when you have a variant like the Delta variant in terms of rapid spread and increased transmissibility. Um, but thank you, Minister. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. I think I'll hand over to um, to Loazi. I see DM has joined us. Um, Loazi, DM will help in with the response and closing the session, but we'll do the questions all of us. All right, thank you very much, Minister. We do have a few questions. Well, I'll ask all of them, they're not that many. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and welcome to the Honorable Deputy Minister as well. Now, uh, we have a question from Heidi Jogosa G is at, at, at ENCA. Um, why were borders not closed or measures put in place and knowing a Delta variant could spread? The second question from Heidi, why must everything always reach crisis level before we act as a government? Why can't we uh, try to plan before uh, variants kill our people? Um, and her third question is, what does this mean in terms of the vaccine rollout, especially for J&J? &J? 
And then we have a question from Sophie Mugwena from the SABC. She's asking, are the current COVID-19 vaccines that are administered in South Africa effective on the Delta variant? And her second question is, is South Africa intending to adjust the current non-pharmaceutical interventions? Um, then we have a question from Jana Marx, and uh, uh, with the permission of Minister, I think uh, maybe the Minister can start with the answer, but I think Professor Tulia de Rivera should probably assist us here as well. And her questions are, uh, can you please confirm how many data cases are present in South Africa at the moment in percentage terms? And she says, in percentage terms, how many cases and how dang are due to the Delta variant, Beta variant and Alpha variant, respectively? And her third question is, can you confirm if there are any cases arising from um, the Brazilian IEP1 strains in South Africa? And I think, Professor Tulio, you can help us with just telling us exactly how these studies are done so that this answer can be interpreted in the context of um, the this, this, this study designs. Um, I think... Um, that was all the questions, Minister. I, I will just check, but I think that was all the questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Loza. I think we'll request uh, Professor Rees to help with the vaccine. Um, did answer it, but I think maybe just to elaborate on what um, Sophie Mkwen has raised. In terms of the, uh, in, are we intending to adjust um, the current non pharmaceutical interventions? due to the variant, we presented this morning to NCCC. And then out of that as well, um, there are meetings that are convened to understand that there's a process in government where um, if there are to be adjustments in terms of regulations, interventions needs to happen. So we understand, we can confirm, and the presidents, I think they can confirm that there will be a net join, there will be an NCCC tomorrow together with special um, meetings to consider what is being proposed as a measure of intervention in relation to what we have presented to them after the discovery of Delta. We've had extensive discussions with NCCC um, and therefore out of that, a, an announcement will be made. We know that it's not the Minister of Health who announces the decisions of the NCCC, but either the president or through the regulations, the announcement is made. So that's the first one that I wanted to deal with uh, from my side. Um, I think let me allow, uh, I'll come in, both as well as the DM can come in in terms of responding to the questions. Was, I think I wanted to take that one specifically uh, in terms of the process. Um, perhaps in terms of um, whether, why we didn't close borders as well. Question from Heidi. Um, the issue of transmissions, and as we develop, I think the scientists will also, I think Professor and, and DM can assist. From a point of regulatory point of view, once we had picked up that um, the issues of transmissions are happening in the manner that they've been happening, we've had community transmissions and the other discussions we had in terms of NCCC and conversations around what we do once Delta was found in India is that the first issue you'd remember, Minister Mkise has said it. We do not even have a direct flight from South Africa to India. So restrictions in terms of movement. So you can't continue to have a country closed in terms of interaction with the world while we're managing the pandemic. You can see what other countries are doing. We've learned over a year in terms of management of the pandemic and how you allow uh, activities to happen. But in the process managing, uh, as we said, it's a risk adjusted strategy between balancing lives and livelihood. So it's quite important for us to continue to remember that. That's why you can't continue to say, you're gonna close the border completely, you restrict movement of people, you restrict movement of goods. Then you completely kill even your own economy and all that. So that's why the vaccine rollout remains important. That's why the other intervention in continuing to monitor how the pandemic is performing is important as part of responding. So to suggest that you just complete, if there's a variant somewhere found, you completely shut down the counter. I don't think it's, it's appropriate. Maybe just, like, just allowing other colleagues to come in, in terms of responding, um, Professor Rees and together with um, Professor Yulo and the DM to come in with the responses to the questions that have been raised by, uh, read out by Lois. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's worth repeating because it's an incredibly important question. The question was, will the vaccines work in the face of the Delta variant? Um, just remember that the generation of vaccines that we're now looking at were developed to respond to the original 
um, uh, Wuhan virus. And as the variants have emerged, all of them have been affected in one way or another. Some vaccines have been able to maintain their ability to counter the uh, impact of, of variants more than others, but all of them have had some impact in terms of their effectiveness. What we saw from the data that's beginning to emerge clearly from a country like the UK is that in two dose uh, schedules, such as for AstraZeneca and Pfizer, if you had only a single dose, then in fact the effectiveness of the vaccine was quite significantly reduced. But once you had two doses, you could see that the effectiveness of the vaccine uh, was really reasonably good, and particularly for severe disease and hospitalization. At the moment, our major ambition as we immunize uh, uh, in, at the moment with going for over 60s, going for people with comorbidities, and soon for the over 50s, um, is to try and stop the most vulnerable uh, being hospitalized and being severely ill. That's our primary ambition at the moment with vaccines. So that data that we've just seen for those two vaccines is very encouraging. But of course, you know, many of these vaccines, as I say, weren't developed when we had a Delta variant. So we are going to have to find very creative ways of monitoring the effectiveness of these vaccines as we roll them out, which is why, as I say, we are discussing uh, a national um, vaccine effectiveness protocol that would allow us to look at all the vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Rees. Uh, Prof. Tulio, uh, would you, could you come in on the proportion, as it were, of um, the variants, and perhaps if you can start with the study design first, and then maybe then explain then the proportion. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, for the question. So, what what we did on the detection of the delta variant, yeah, or at least the increase of the proportion, yeah, is to do uh, what we call random population sampling. Yeah. And when we, so, so far South Africa has produced 10,000 virus genomes, yeah. And these virus genomes, they are sampling every week from random selected samples in close collaboration with the National Health Laboratories Service, yeah. So what we did, uh, especially here in KwaZulu-Natal, what we got worried is that very fast increase on prevalence. So for example, in the last, in, in the last, um, just get the number here in the last in the last 68 genomes that we produced from uh, like a week ago yeah around 48 of them were the delta variant yeah what it means and that it's it's already very surprising it's even more surprising on the breadth of the distribution of the clinics these were sampled from over 30 different clinical sites from the residual qpcr diagnostics yeah and many of them hundreds and hundreds of kilometers ago so that's what we see and then if you go back a uh, week before the prevalence is decreasing yeah and so we see this is staggering increasing with the prevalence of the variant in random selected samples across uh, KwaZulu-Natal province and that's closely associated with the increase of numbers of infections yeah just to highlight that to sequence a uh, whole genomes of the virus yeah is not a simple process yeah it's a time consuming and a complex process so what we are doing now as a collective on the network of genomics surveillance and we have a few labs of our network working now during the weekend and day and night and my lab is busy all this weekend yeah to produce now in the next five days at least 500 or a thousand genomes of random selected areas within the country yeah? so that's what we we have been doing and we take a random selection approach and what we have seen is that at the moment we have a, a we have a, around 100 delta variant genomes but what we saw is the very fast increase on prevalence across different random selected clinics yeah 
and I, I just would like just to comment one thing on on Helen's response. Yeah, one one advantage that South Africa has now about having, if there is any, about having the same variant that is circulating and cause most of infections in the in the world. Yeah, is that a lot of the results that we need on a vaccine. Uh, effectively can be done not only in South Africa but across the world and that's why the UK could present that high efficacious um, results with the exactly same variant the variant that's dominating the UK epidemic now it is exactly the same one the Delta one with almost identical with almost no mutations different thank you very much Luaz yeah Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Minister Diem has indicated that he will, he is um, having trouble with his machine and will not be able to be audible. Although he is here with us, I can see him, he's on the platform, but he will not be, be audible. Um, and Minister, there were two other questions that came in. May I, may I um, uh, pose those questions? Then I think there are some questions in the Q&A. But Minister, it's already two o'clock, so um, I don't know if, if the Minister will maybe allow the panelists to manage those ones or the Minister can pick up one or two after I've done these two questions from the media. I think it is time for us to try and wrap up. Um, so the, the two questions that um, came through is um, with the, um, this is from uh, Dr. Fundi Lenyati, with the good performance of AstraZeneca, um, what do we think about um, perhaps using it again uh, in, in terms of the Delta variant? And then um, there was then another question that came through, which is when will a decision be made as to what happens in Gauteng and how is the province operating as normal when cases are out of control? And, um, and uh, also there's an allegation that patients are being taken to KZN because there's no space in, in GP hospitals. And that question came from uh, Heidi uh, Giocos at ENCA again. Um, then, Minister, I think that there's a frequently asked question once again. I know the Minister has covered this, but perhaps if we can just provide reassurance about um, when we are going to be addressing the issue of potential stricter um, uh, uh, regulations in terms of the Disaster Management Act. Thank, thank you, Minister. We'll, have, we'll take Minister's guidance on the Q&As uh, on the platform. Yeah. Let's, take, let's take the colleagues, who the, and then I can wrap up with all that remains with her. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Nisana, perhaps if you can come in. Um, with, with your thoughts, Professor Nisana, if you can come in with your thoughts on AstraZeneca, um, perhaps just a high level sort of scientific uh, thoughts on that one. Thanks, Rosie. So, so you know, the question about AstraZeneca, we just need to recall that when we could not use AstraZeneca in the country, it was because of its uh, very poor performance and efficacy on um, the uh, beta variant. And so um, I guess the question then that Dr. Nyati is, is asking is, if then we, de we get to be actually um, uh, shift the infections to, to actually the Delta variant, which we have seen that it actually, you know, the, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine works well against it. Is that a possibility? My response would be, we actually would need to explore that and see if that might be something we want to consider. Firstly, we need to use the, va the vaccines that we have currently, you know, in the country. And then secondly, it will be a matter of looking to see how much, you know, um, Delta variant do we then see in the country across, which would make us to go back and reconsider AstraZeneca. But for now, it is something that we're going to need to look at and try and, and, and collect the data and see if it is a, an alternative we could explore into the future. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Mlesana. I think I'll hand back to the Honorable Minister and we can move to closure after she has dealt with some of the other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luaz. I'm trying to also respond to some of the written questions so that we can assist the colleagues in the media houses um, in terms of that. Um, 
as I said, in terms of whether we're going to have new restrictions and all that, we met this morning with an NCCC convened by the president. We presented the information about the Delta variant. Out of that, then a decision has been taken for NetJoint to consider whether the restrictions that we currently have are sufficient. There is a belief that the current restrictions, especially when we deal with counting, are not sufficient. And therefore, recommendations will be made. Tomorrow, NCCC is meeting in the morning. That will be followed by um, other meetings, that means to be. And hopefully, we'll know out of that, depending what is being recommended from NCCC. You know that the process is that whatever we present as a recommendation from health, it goes through and net joint. Net joint then makes those recommendations to NCCC. If NCCC agrees with whether we need to have the restrictions, that will be taken through the PCC Presidential Coordinating Council, which is um, with the premiers and the mayors and traditional leaders. Um, out of that, then a special cabinet. So presidency can confirm um, through that. I think the minister and presidency is available to either confirm what is the process. I think I would leave it to her as a competent person in this area to deal with. So from our side, we can definitely say that there is a need to consider what we are facing in terms of assisting us to manage the surge. Um, so that's, that's where we are in terms of that. Uh, the issue around as well, I think, um, which one did I leave? I think those are the ones because um, the chair of MEC has responded to the issue of the vaccines. So that's what was pending. So I think that's all from the questions. Yes, thank you, Minister. We are covered. Yes. Uh, maybe just to thank, we'll continue to, you know, inform the nation about the developments. I think the message from us um, to South Africans is that, as we said, we are in the third wave. and We are seeing numbers rising. We can only win this battle with your help. So just self-restraint, also assisting our families, assisting our friends, everybody whom you see that is not conducting themselves in an appropriate way, it will really be appreciated that we continue to urge them really to restrain themselves, observing the non-pharmaceutical protocols that we are calling for, um, that are in place, sorry, that are in place in terms of wearing our, our, our mask properly, of sanitizing and social distancing. We are also appealing, it's weekend now, those of us in Houghton, please can we avoid social gatherings? We are getting a lot of messages around activities around social gatherings. Delta variant, if it's within, you are within a close proximity of a person who has this, you will be able to get this variant, um, you will be infected. It spreads faster as the information has come through. So we can only help government to bring these numbers and all of us to bring these numbers by also being responsible. I also reiterate what I've said. Leaders of political parties, we're appealing to you. We're really, really appealing to you. Can we assist this government? Can we assist the nation? The events, whether you deny that your event is a super spreader, it's not about that. It's scientifically proven that when you have a gathering of many people, that event will become a super spread. Two wrongs, don't make it right. Don't argue that people are doing this. Let's help each other. Each one of us have a duty. Each one of us have a responsibility. Do your part, help us. While you do your part, you'll be encouraging others to not spread the pandemic in their conduct. Many people would raise in terms of traveling. If you see another one, to say that that person is not conducting themselves appropriately. You will be doing your civil duty by reminding them that their conduct is unbecoming and is unacceptable. So where the police are not able to arrive, where we are not able to observe those non-compliance, you as a South African, you become our eyes and ears to help us contain and manage this pandemic. There are reports that says uh, people are being transported to the provinces, other provinces. We do not have those information. I thought I should respond to that, Loazi. But 
we do understand and know that Houten is under pressure. And because it's weekend, those who are going to be in drinking alcohol, being responsible, please, can you stay at home? Just for once, take a decision that I'm going to stay at home. Because you're compromising the other families. It's not something that cannot be done. You will still be showing your remorse. You will still be showing that you care, even when you phone, even if you send an SMS to the bereaved family. The visiting to families in and out daily are also causing a problem. So we just want to say, let's understand this are a, a different environment. This is a different environment that we are finding ourselves. The numbers that are surging can only come down when you help us. We are pleading with you, South Africans. We are pleading with you, Houtengas. We are pleading with you to really respond to our call. We can increase the restrictions, but without your response, we'll not be able to beat this pandemic. Help us to win this battle. Help the frontline workers who are starting to see signs of fatigue, signs of exhaustion. Help us beat this pandemic. Help us beat the third wave. The surge is on, and we can only do that with your help. This is my plea to you, South Africans. This is my plea to you, Houtengas as the acting Minister of Health, please help us. We've reached a point where we need all of you to respond. We've reached a point where we need all of you to help us to bring the numbers down and to help our frontline workers. Have hope, give hope to them, to all of us. It's not a joke. People are being infected daily. Messages that we are getting from families being infected. Those who are infected, please be responsible. Stay and isolate. Stay at home. Don't leave your home. We have our call line. We have our hotline that is currently working effectively. You can SMS. You can WhatsApp. You can call for help, for guidance, for assistance where you are not sure about what you need to do. Let's remind ourselves what we have done. We've beat, we are able to beat wave, the first wave. We are able to beat the second wave. We can only be able to beat the third wave with your help. So that's my plea to you. And I hope you'll respond positively so that we can see the numbers going down. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for your leadership. Thank you for leading with transparency and for leading with urgency. And may we all heed the very important calls that you have made to us. And finally, thank you to the esteemed panelists and our media partners and to members of the public who joined us at such short notice uh, for this very important update. And we hereby close the press briefing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Recording stopped.